We need to believe it, the pathetic condition in which those children come just for the midday meal. There is no education, there is just enrollment. Well, I think that's exactly right. Um, one of the things that we do emphasize in our study, Jean, Jean Dres and I, and we are actually trying to also write in the new book following our 2002 book, but it's also in the 2002 thing, that one of the things that has never been present in India is lack of parental enthusiasm, which is often blamed for something which is simply not uh, a way of understanding that. I think our problems have been the lack of facilities and the lack of the quality of education. And, and it requires institutional concern. It also requires resource concern. But the amount of interest that kids have, and I'm delighted that question was up in the adverse of circumstances in being educated and in co-educational schools, have been um, very large indeed, and we know that even from other reports, other than those produced by the trust that I was privileged to set up, the G Trust with my Nobel money, but we know also from other reports, like the Probe report, that there's enormous amount of enthusiasm about girls as well as boys' education in India. And if we cannot make full use of that, that is a problem with the system, rather than the asthma. So I'm delighted the point was made. Yes, uh... I would like to very briefly from both speakers hear about the importance of emerging into an economy that uh, pays attention to our ecological problems. It's something that economists so often neglect still today, even though I think the uh, precipice is just around the corner on that issue. And anything that we do in terms of growth has to be growth that is sustainable. And uh, I would like to both of you to just very briefly indicate where you stand on those issues. I think the, the appropriate way to, to deal with the sustainability and, and other environmental issues is through very sizable investments in technology and uh, science. We have great possibilities of changing materials, of uh, protecting the, 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 the planet in ways that will enable us to keep growing and will indeed create jobs, and et cetera. So I'm a big uh, fan for green economy things. Well, uh, just to add a little to that, the, um, uh, basically we have to be concerned not with sustainable growth, but sustainable development, which includes sustaining growth. But And in fact, the, the, um, uh, the, the work that we are trying to finish, uh, John Dries and I, uh, this has a very much a central role to play. And, and I'm very glad that the issue was raised to be, to be pursued more, uh, more fully. But I would like to urge that we just don't think only in terms of growth. Growth is extremely important. And we need sustained growth, but mainly because we need sustained development. 
Not surprisingly, there are a very large number of questions, but I only have time for one. So I think in the interest of gender balance, uh, you're nicely covered up, but is that a lady in blue or no? Yes, you are there. <laughs> uh, I have a question with suggestion as well uh, to Dr. Aluyala, the Deputy Chairperson, Chairman of Planning Commission Office. <coughs> The question is with regard to the economic policies for emerging economy and that, that is meant for space education. So my suggestions for India to introduce for higher education both for arts and science the space education and its impact, effect and effects which will help for Indian economy as well as for the global economy. I have an ac applications to, I have written it for, to give it to Professor Aluyala uh, to introduce in the planning commission's uh, departments for its purposes. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, you can give me the application and we'll take okay. a look at it. Since Thank we you. now have a little time, one question is still feasible. Yes. Uh, can't hear. Minimum wages should be increased in the economies. In India, government has been increasing the minimum wages in the industries also pay more than minimum wages. But due to the some government scheme, uh, we have 15 minutes is, left. Sort of we have 15 minutes left. Sort of minutes left. To the Perfect. Is it right? Uh, uh, this should be done or not? Yeah. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I don't know. In your presentation, you note that the minimum wage is Yeah, I mean, what, 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 what normally happens when you raise the minimum wage and the formal sector firms uh, pay the minimum wage, if the minimum is too high, you will see that the, the, the work will shift to the informal sector. And th then it becomes an interesting question because if there's some mobility between the informal and formal sector, and if the demand curve is inelastic, you do get a transfer of income to the lower income uh, uh, people who are covered by the minimum. Well, uh, we now reach the end of the session, and I don't want to cut into the time of the next session, so let me, on behalf of all of you, thank our two speakers for very stimulating lectures. Very well, sir. And uh, I think we can now vacate the stage for the next, uh, next session. Honorable Deputy Chairman, Planning Commission, sir, we thank you for chairing and moderating the session.
We have your kind attention, please. You are requested to take the seats before we start our next session. If you want to speak from here, you can also, but if that's more convenient. May I once again request you to kindly be seated because it is delaying our esteemed panelists here as they have to fly back today. So we would appreciate if you would please come and be seated. Our first plenary panel on global slowdown and economic policy making in emerging economies is what we are going to commence with now. Before we start with the session, let us welcome our esteemed panelists, Ms. Chanda Kochar, Managing Director and CEO, ICICI Bank, Dr. Zimmerman, Professor of Economics at Bonn University, Dr. Kishore Mehbabani, Dean and Professor, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, Professor Nivekar Singh, University of California, Santa Cruz, Justin Yifu Lin, World Bank Chief Economist and Senior Vice President, Development Economics. Be Before we request Dr. Rangarajan to chair and moderate the session, let us felicitate our esteemed panelists with a memento. We call upon Sri Abhay Kumar to felicitate Ms. Chanda Kocher. Ms. Shweta to come on stage, please to felicitate Professor Zimmerman with a money plant and a memento. We now call on Sri Shubhash Meena to felicitate Professor Kishore Mahabubani. Sri Jagdish Kumar kindly come on stage to felicitate Professor Nirvikar Singh. Sri Rangit Ghosh to come on stage please to felicitate Professor Justin Yufiolin. Before we request Dr. Rangarajan to chair and moderate the session, we would like to say a few words about him. Dr. C. Rangarajan, Chairman, Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, has played a key role both as an academician and a policymaker. He has held several important positions which include Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Chairman of the 12th Finance Commission. He is also the Chairman of Madras School of Economics and the founding Chairman of the C.R. Rao Advanced Institute of Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Sciences. Apart from being an economist par excellence, he also has a rich experience in the political arena. He was a distinguished former member of parliament and has also served as a governor of Andhra Pradesh. In recognition to his distinguished service to the nation, Dr. Rangarajan was awarded Padma Bibhushan in 2002, the second high civilian award in India. Sir, we request you to open the session by introducing our esteemed panelists for today. Distinguished uh, delegates to the conference, uh, it gives me great pleasure to chair this session on global slowdown and economic policy making in emerging economies. Uh, the world is passing through a difficult time and in fact more so the developed world. The advanced economies of the world are yet to recover from the crisis of 2008. 
the process of recovery has been slow. And even before they could make a full recovery, they are now, they are now caught in a second crisis. Uh, this second crisis has originated in Europe. And if the crisis of 2008 was a result of excesses in the private financial sector, the current crisis in Europe is because of the excesses in the public sector. The sovereign debt problem which Europe faces has its own consequences. In some ways it is more difficult to handle sovereign debt rather than private debt. Hopefully the European countries will come together and find a solution. The richer countries, which primarily includes Germany, must be willing to come to the help of the poorer countries. And the poorer countries must be willing to put in place a credible fiscal consolidation program over the medium term. What is happening in the developed world is affecting the rest of the world. Countries like India escape the direct impact of the 2008 crisis because the Indian banks have not invested in the toxic assets. But they have not escaped from the indirect impact of the recessionary conditions in the advanced world. As we move ahead, it is extremely important to find out how the emerging economies can insulate themselves, can manage their economies, despite what is happening in the advanced economies. The developments in the advanced economies affect the developing economies in two ways. There are two channels through which the impact is felt. One is through the trade flows 